I'd like to start by thanking Mr. Kyle McCleary for inspiring me to continue on with this project and hopefully this will serve as a good study tool for my students um, to study the cat on their own. Um, a couple of quick disclaimers. First of all, any mistakes are obviously going to be my own and my own only, so uh, hopefully we don't run into any problems, but um, I'm sure you'll let me know if we run into any uh, inconsistencies. Uh, second of all, this should never take the place of actually dissecting. This is much more complex when you're doing it yourself and finding them. I'm just using this as a guide for students to use uh, to help out in the process. We're going to start by taking a look at some body regions and external structures on the cat. Uh, on our checklist, what we see are several terms that we'll use to describe throughout all of dissections. We're going to start by describing a dorsal uh, region. Now the dorsal region on the cat obviously is going to be the back. Why this is significant is it's a little bit different in humans because our dorsal region is still our back but our, do our back, how the cats are oriented because of the quadrupeds is slightly different than uh, what we'd normally expect. For the cat the dorsal region is going to be the back and the ventral region just like the humans is going to be the stomach. Now we tend to use those terms interchangeably in humans. Dorsal is also going to be our posterior and ventral is also going to be our anterior. Where we run into problems is truly with the cat because they're quadrupeds we we'll use the terms differently. Ventral is still going to be the stomach area or if the cat is lying this way but as we work our way anteriorly we mean toward the head. Different in human again because anterior and ventral are going to be the same thing. In cats, we're going to separate those out. Again, anterior is going to be toward our head, and posterior is going to be toward the tail. There are better terms for that. We'll use cranial, meaning referring toward the head, caudal, meaning toward the tail. You'll see those terms later on as well. When we talk about the terms proximal versus distal, this is probably the best example I can give with that. Proximal means toward the attachment point uh, to the body itself. So if we look at the bones of the radius and ulna here, this would be the proximal point, this would be the distal point. If we look at the humerus, we've got the bone from here to here, this would be up here at the shoulder would be the proximal attachment, here would be the distal part of the humerus itself. All of the bones are named this way um, and we should be able to use those throughout the dissections, proximal and distal. When we talk through the terms lateral and medial, it simply means toward or away from the midline. So here's the midline, you can see that nice and clear um, of the linea alba as it comes up from the, the stomach up through the chest and pectoral cavities. Um, what we're going to see with lateral means we're going to start at this midline and work our way to the side. As we go from to the medial, we start laterally and work our way toward the middle. So the terms uh, lateral and medial are just meaning toward what direction we're going to be moving. The next set of terms that we have are to describe regions and we really want to focus on what they're going to be, uh, their primary functions are going to be. The first of which on our list is the thoracic region. Now that obviously if you think what's inside we're going to have our lungs and we're going to have our heart. So the thoracic region is specialized for circulation as well as respiration. The next on our list is the abdominal cavity or abdominal region. That's going to be basically from below the uh, diaphragm to where the, the hips or the pelvic uh, cavity is. So it's going to be this region in here. Think what's inside, we're going to have our small intestine and our stomach, so we're going to find primarily digestive regions. Okay, Within the pelvic region, we're going to find here, a lot of people would immediately think in terms of reproductive, but also keep in mind, this is also specialized for excretion. So two functions within the pelvic region. And another one that's actually new for us is going to be the caudal region. That's going to be referring to the tail region. So we can talk about things working their way caudally, and basically what that is referring to is working their way toward the tail. Those are indeed the, going to be the caudal vertebrae as well. Now in terms of external structures, we're going to see a lot of specialized structures within the cat and other quadrupeds that we will not find in the human. So we do need to spend some time taking a look at those. First of all, we're going to see the ear flaps themselves. Their ears are set up a little bit differently than ours. Uh, they're going to be able to rotate those around to locate sounds, unlike the human. First term that we're going to find on there is the ear flaps themselves, called the pinnae. Okay, so they're specialized just for the uh, sensing of sound. Now the eyelids, they're going to be set up 
just like the human. We find two sets of eyelids, um, just uh, again, just like the human. The top one is going to be superior. The bottom one is going to be inferior. So basically we find these two, and the term that we use for eyelids is palpebra. So we have the superior palpebra, the top eyelid, and we have the inferior uh, palpebra, the bottom eyelid. Now cats and other animals, as they're uh, specialized for hunting and things like that, are going to have a third eyelid. That's actually not all that rare um, in the animal world. And this is kind of hard to identify within uh, a cat that's been euthanized like this. But basically you'll see a third eyelid as it comes up from the corner here. And it'll actually work its way up. And that's for uh, a lot of times, most animals will use this as protection as they're feeding. So cats will actually use this third eyelid to protect the eye as they're feeding. Now, I don't know how factual this is, but it kind of makes sense to me. Most of the time, if you take a look at how close the, the mouth is to the eye, these animals in the wild would be feeding on uh, live animals that would fight back, and those animals would tend to lash out um, and potentially damage the eye, thus hurt, uh, hurting the cat. So we use uh, the, they would use the third eyelid to protect the eye while feeding or attacking or something like that. And the term we use for that third eyelid is the nictitating membrane. A lot of animals will have this. You'll find it in sharks and frogs and a bunch of other animals um, to clean off uh, the eyelid. Now, another thought with this, uh, again, I'm not sure how factual or accurate it is, but if something were to, in fact, get in the eye, the superior and inferior palpebra aren't really sufficient. If we've tried to blink out uh, sand and things like that, we have difficulty ourselves with that. So the third eyelid of the nictitating uh, membrane may be there for uh, helping to clean out because obviously they can't use their fingers to do so. Again, just a thought. I'm not quite sure in the accuracy of that one. Moving down on our list, we have a couple other terms. One is the external nares. Okay? We use nares for the nostril openings themselves, so they have an external nares. And then the next one on our list is going to be the vibrissae. Vibrissae are the whiskers. Now the function of the whiskers is a lot of students will be somewhat accurate but maybe could do a better job in describing the function. Yes, they are there for sensing, but basically if you take a look at the length of the vibrissae, they're going to be exactly the same width of the cat. And basically what that does is as a cat is uh, chasing or, or finding and locating food, a lot of times they're going to be going into small openings. So a cat can come and if the opening is too small, it's going to uh, the opening is going to uh, send off signals along the vibrissae and let the cat know that it, the rest of its body can't follow. So it's there for sensing, but basically so it knows the diameter of, a, uh, of an opening and basically an orientation as to uh, its surroundings because it has a tough time seeing and judging. Its head is much smaller than its abdomen, um, so now it knows and has a sensor for what can fit through that opening. Now the nipples on, that's on our list, we'd find in the, uh, in the cats with the skin on. Since this cat has been, uh, the skin has been removed for us, we will not see those, but they'd be up in basically the pectoral region, um, the thoracic region, and we'd find it in both male and female. It makes sense if you think of it in terms of humans, males have nipples as well. They're just not functioning, and the same holds true for the cats. When we talk about the philtrum, what we're talking about with this is the split lip of a cat. These animals are very similar to us in that the lips are set up the same way, but you'll see this one crack or crevice going through, and that is actually sep uh, the muscles are separated there, so they have separate control on either side of the lips. Unlike us, it's one continual muscle that runs all the way around. So the philtrum is referring to the split lip, enabling them to manipulate one side of the mouth or the other side of the mouth independently. Again, in case there's food that gets stuck or something like that, they can use the separated muscles to dislodge that. The last one on our list is the torus or tori. Um, what we're referring to in that is going to be uh, just simply the pads that we find on the paw. Okay, Those are going to be the paw pads themselves and they're extra calloused and extra thick, uh, a special type of tissue to resist abrasion.